You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What's up out there? This is the Straight to Video Podcast with myself, Rob Lane. And you know what? I totally forgot to mention it on the last episode, but we're into double figures with these shows already. This is episode 11. Dang, things are moving so fast. So thanks for listening and enjoying what is happening here. On today's episode, I'm talking to the singer of one of my favourite bands from the past couple of years. I got to chat with Brendan Scholes of the band Mercy Music. They're a Las Vegas-based trio who released their new album Nothing in the Dark on September 18th through Wiretap Records. I first heard Mercy Music a couple of years ago when um, my friend Johnny Monaco said to check them out. Now when Johnny recommends someone, I've learnt to do it, because the last time he did that I got to see a band called Ashbury Keys who are from Texas and... Since then, they've become really good friends of mine, and they're a great band. So yeah, when Monaco says a band are worth listening to, then I make sure I do. The Mercy Music song I heard was called Song 4, and I was all in, like full on. It's such a killer punk rock, power pop tune, and just so hooky. Certainly something I would dub Laney Fodder. The video is insane too, and the band looked cool as hell. They kind of reminded me of the band The Explosion, if any of you can remember those guys. And they just had that genuine rock and roll vibe. Nothing you could put directly in a category, just a great rock band. Sort of like I would describe maybe early Goo Goo Dolls, The Replacements, or my favourite Soul Asylum. You could see any of these bands just destroy in a bar, theatre or arena. Anything like that will do. Mercy Music have a new single out right now leading up to the new record called Living With A Ghost, which again is excellent, so I'm super excited to hear the full album. It was really cool to talk to Brendan. He seems kind of shy at times, a little like I can be too, so the two of us together could potentially be a bit of a struggle, but I really liked him, and he was really open about stuff. After listening back to the chat, there were a few things I wish I'd gone a little further into, so hopefully we can get him back on the show at some point. What was cool though was finding out his love of the band Degeneration, which I didn't realise he was such a fan of. And he also mentions the Gym Blossoms at one point, who I love too, which was a big surprise. But after he said that, and like listening to a lot of Mercy music whilst prepping this show, I was kind of blown away by how much of an influence they've obviously been. I wouldn't have compared the two beforehand, what with Brendan's band being much more harder hedged, but now he's said it, then I can hear it so much in his melodies and song structures. It's kind of awesome. While still pretty young, there's a fair bit of history and hard work that's gone by in Brendan's career already. He's been in bands from a very young age, and I mean like very young, and all of them have courted some big record label interest. He talks of his band Absent Minded through to Lydia Vance and finally forming Mercy Music in 2013. I think a lot of you out there will really like this band, so if you want to hit them up, it'd be great to see a bunch of new people head their way after checking out this podcast. You can find them on Facebook by just searching Mercy Music or on Twitter at Mercy Music One, that's a number one on the end, and Instagram is just Mercy Music. Hope you enjoy this episode and please continue to like, follow, and share the Straight to Video podcast. So here we go with my chat with Brendan Scholes of Mercy Music. We have a mutual friend in Johnny Monaco from Chicago. Oh, yeah. Done a few gigs with him. The thing about Las Vegas, it's, well, I guess it's a blessing and a curse, but I mean, the cover band thing here is still really big. Mm-hmm. And if I need money or if an opportunity presents itself, I can always go out and do that. And uh, he's mutual friends with my really good friend, Mike Zuter. Okay. And he couldn't do a few gigs with me. And Johnny Q was out visiting. So I did a few gigs with him and he played bass, which was hilarious because wow. I was playing guitar. And yeah. He can play circles around me. He was the one who actually introduced me to to Mercy Music a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
he sent me the link to Song 4, and uh, I've been hooked since then. Oh, thank you. He's a good dude. He's a sweetheart. I read you picked up the guitar at like a really early age, like nine years old or something. Yeah, I was I was nine. I had to fight my mom like for a few years too because she kept telling me my my hands were too small. And then it turned into well, if we do it, you have to get an acoustic first. Mm -hmm. We had an acoustic. My mom's acoustic, and I always would just pull it out and play with it. And then it was like you got to play piano first, and then eventually that just all stopped. And she <laughs> she took me to the guitar store. I rented a guitar with an amp. So you're kind of pretty focused at such a young age. It's normally the parents that force the instrument on the kids. Yeah. That, I mean, I can't think of a time in my life, you know, like where I had coherent thought that I didn't gravitate towards it or want to do it. I think it was Johnny. Did he tell me you're a nephew of Tom Scholes from Boston? Is that correct? Or is that something I've made up? Yeah, that's true. My family dynamic, he's my, he's my dad's brother. And the Scholes side of the family, he wasn't like a... He wasn't around no. or anything like that. So, I mean, my dad wasn't around most of my life. So I was, I was aware of it later. Mm -hmm. There were like platinum records up and stuff in my grandmother's house. It just I never really thought about it. I mean, maybe <laughs> it's in my in my DNA for some reason. I mean, hereditarily speaking, I, I don't know. But just music in general always had, it was like always the focal point. And my, my mom even tells me stories about, you know, when I was, you know, three or four, just like the way I'd react to to certain songs on the radio and stuff like that. So was it the radio that enticed you or was it MTV or anything like that? If MTV was still playing music at that time? I didn't have cable television until 2001. <laughs> so probably the radio. The radio was a big deal. And then my mom, I have to hand it to my mom and my dad as far as like being highly influential in my musical taste because my mom my mom was in a band in the 80s she used to play with the meat puppets and stuff like that because oh, wow. we're i'm from i'm from arizona originally mm -hmm. but she introduced me to like you know the punk and and new wave side of things but like elvis costello squeeze the jam the clash uh stuff like that joe jackson hendrix was a big one from her and then my dad was more classic rock and blues type stuff but like you know humble pie and you know led zeppelin james gang so so, and Thin Lizzy was a huge one for me right. too, also for my mom. I'm grateful I had that because I think that kind of put me on whatever path I ended up on. Definitely. I mean, was that kind of introduced to you at a young age? I mean, that's kind of stuff where you, which you perhaps pick up on when you were like 15 or 16. But if you're having it thrown at you when it was... No, definitely really young because my mom had the jailbreak cassette and that was like always a, that yeah. was a big deal to get in the car and listen to jailbreak. That's awesome. So that was kind of like your top 40 radio. Well, well, where most kids would be listening to top 40, you were getting this education. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny that I'm such a nerd. Because when I had an ear, like she'd, you know, in the mid to late 90s, she'd hear the single on the radio and then buy the cassette. And she kind of stuck with the single and I'd end up with the cassettes. Yeah. But like through that, like I got, you know, Weezer's Blue Album. I got the Gin Blossoms. That whole record's great. The Congratulations. I'm sorry. I can't remember which one. But my mom always had, had that ear or like, she bought Offspring Smash because she heard self-esteem on the radio. That's cool. And man. I ended up with that. So you picked the guitar up at nine. Did I read that you began performing in coffee shops at age 10? Is that right? Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of stuff was you playing? I do covers. Yeah. I did a lot of, like I do a lot of Green Day. I do Sublime. And uh, I did like a few Our Lady Peace songs because they had like one hit over here that was big for a minute. What else did I, and then I like I started doing <laughs> I started doing whatever originals I, I had tried writing at that point. What was the response to that? It went over well. The whole thing started because my brother worked at this coffee shop that would go to on the weekends and would stop by and say hi and then have like acoustic duo entertainment on the patio. And I was like sitting out there and I, I think I was like a smart ass about something because <laughs> they were, you know, I was like I probably 10, 10 or 11. And I, I think I said something because I'm an asshole. And he's like, well, why don't you come up and, and play? And I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. And then they had me start coming up with them. And then they'd take me to their other gigs during the week. So, like, my mom would drive me to, like, the college part of, like, the ASU part of Arizona and Tempe during the week. And, I'd like, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'd do shows with them. I'd have, like, my 45-minute period. And mm -hmm. then I'd do Saturdays again. So, and I'd get, like, you know, my portion of the tip jar or whatever. Was you cleaning up with against everybody else who were there? Because who's this kid? <laughs> I don't I don't. He gets don't all the know. tips. <laughs> Did you pick it up pretty fast then with the learning the guitar? I think so, yeah. And that's, I'm grateful for that. Like, I'm not good at a lot of things, but it, it did. And I realized early on that I had an ear to pick stuff out by myself, which has been a huge, I mean, without that, I'd be absolutely nothing, I don't think. So did you play your first show before you even saw a show? 
I think I saw maybe a couple local bands. My mom took me because she had friends that had friends in a band or something. Okay. Maybe before I'd played my first thing. But yeah, more than likely, yeah. Can you remember your first concert, which you actually went to as a, a fan? There was that local show, which I think was my first ever concert. And then I saw, I saw Boston in like 95, right. 96. And then Green Day in 97 on the Nimrod tour was like my first show that I wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. And I, I waited and, you know, I was like, Green Day was the epicenter of my life. Yeah. Probably till my sophomore year of high school. But I saw them on that tour in a small club and Degeneration opened. And that, that was like... Love those guys. When I saw DJ, I'm like, this is like what a band is supposed to be like. Right. But I just thought like, I saw them come out and I'm like, this is like, this is what rock and roll is. Yeah. And I think that's what really brought on like my really into the 77 style, you know, CBGB stuff growing up too, like your dead boys and, and such. Well, I, I didn't realize you were such a big fan of Degeneration. We, we actually got to open for them when they put this last record out. And that was like a huge deal. And the, the turnout was not good at that show. So it was kind of like bittersweet. But like it was like a it's a big deal for me to do it. Yeah, because they, like, they went from like the Green Day tour and they played with Kiss. So there's kind of one of those bands which didn't really fit into any specific hole. I think I'm drawn to that too. Like find myself in the same position with whatever Mercy Music is doing. So or whatever band I've had. People love to say it's a blessing after they've been successful or, you know, have been like it's worked out for them. But it's it's definitely a curse, I think, in a lot of ways. You know, I like that we're different, but I can't say it's helped us in any. <laughs> I mean, it's made me have to fight harder for whatever we do have. I think a lot of the time the general public wants to pigeonhole a band. And so if something yeah. comes along, which is a little bit different, they're like, it confuses them for a while <laughs> before yeah. they actually hear what it's all about. Other than... The podcast which I do for Straight to Video, one of the things which I do is um, cover versions of my favorite movie soundtrack songs from the 80s and 90s. And I saw that you're a big fan of the Angus movie soundtrack. Yeah. Did you see the film and like kind of think, oh, these, this soundtrack's really cool or was it the other way around? I heard about the movie because I know <laughs> I heard that Green Day had an unreleased song okay. at the time on the soundtrack. And or I, rented, I rented it. I didn't see it in the theater. Probably, again, in that same period of time, like fourth, fourth, fifth grade. It couldn't have been much later than that. And um, then I got the soundtrack at the grocery store, ironically enough. I mean, that opened the door to... I mean, Green Day had already done that for me a little bit with the Lookout catalog. Mm -hmm. So that was pivotal for me, too. But yeah, but just like the muffs and tilt. And then that fucking... When the Goo Goo Dolls fucking rocked. <laughs> Yeah, I love Ellie Goo Goo Dolls, man. It's yeah, <laughs> that song, man, that's still one of my favorite songs. So, into the yeah. usual. So much good stuff. I still, yeah, I still listen to it. <laughs> so, what were the other outlets for you for discovering music back then? You mentioned Green Day and Lookout. It was the the trickle down of finding finding a band and then finding the label. Yeah, to be honest, because again, like I didn't, because I, I guess what I'm a millennial or whatever, <laughs> so I didn't. But like, I was always late. I didn't have a computer or anything till the, till the early 2000s or cable television. So I was very, you know. Still kind of old school. Yeah. So like, I'd, I mean, through grade school, I'd make tapes off the radio of like when they played songs that I liked and shit like that. But then when I, I discovered, you know, your Punkarama compilations or stuff like that at the at the record store and then, uh, you know, go from there and I, I, you know, get the mail order catalog from like, you know, Epitaph or Lookout, Fat, stuff like that. And that's how I found out about bands. Yeah, I think that's one of the cool things with the punk rock genre. People are as much a fan of the label as they are the bands, really. Yeah, a label releases something, they'll take a punt on it and because they trust the label in a way. Nothing was as easily accessible, so it was kind of exciting, I guess, to discover new things that way. You moved to Las Vegas as a teenager. Yeah. I would imagine like music is all-consuming of you at that point. Uh, was it exciting for you to move out there, and did you have any ideas music-wise? We moved out here because my, uh, my younger brother was an elite gymnast, and mm -hmm. one of the best facilities in the world is out here. Right. So my mom moved the whole family. Yeah. <laughs> I was fucking livid because I had like friends and everything else. And it was in the middle of like eighth grade for me. But it, I mean, I guess it all worked out. I don't think it, I'd change anything. I mean, I started no. my first like band out here and everything else. So you'd not been in a band at that point. It was kind of like becoming a teenager and heading out there. I just played played by myself. <laughs> yeah. Ironically, my, my youngest brother that we moved out here for, he, he played the drums. So when we moved out here, we kind of had time on our hands because we didn't really know anybody yet so we started playing together and that was like the first inception of my first band right but we're, we're like worse than the gallagher's we would have killed each other <laughs>
<laughs> How are you now? He's he's actually a heroin addict, and no one's really quite sure <laughs> sure where he is. Oh wow. Oh man. Sorry to get dark, but we're pretty sure he's alive right now. So we're yeah. we're happy with that. That's a whole other podcast. For those of us who are not from there, I would imagine there are very different sides to Las Vegas other than the one which we see on TV and the one which we visit as a tourist. So how did you go about finding your place in the city? Is there a large underground music scene away from the strip? It's a it's a really small city. A thing people don't really see, you know, when they think of Las Vegas. But it, I mean, it's really tiny. You can get to state line to where I live, which is like on the opposite side and probably 45 minutes if there's no traffic. Right. It's tiny. As far as like the, the music side of things, they have a, a performance art, arts high school here called Las Vegas Academy. And we found out about it and I auditioned to get in to um, be in the guitar program. And they ended up canceling it the year I auditioned. So they asked if I played any other instruments. And I actually, I played stand-up bass in the orchestra. I got into the high school doing that. And that's how I kind of... I mean, got into the scene, so to speak. So is there kind of like a large underground music scene away from the Strip? There is, because with Vegas, there's so many other, you know, attractions mm -hmm. that live music is, it's always been a push. But there's definitely a concentrated scene here. There always has been. You formed the band Absent Minded, and your very first show was a showcase for Island Records. You got to work with um, Bill Stevenson of The Descendants and Ryan Green of Fat Wreck. Our first real show was actually with the Killers. Wow! Right, the Killers uh, got got, got uh, famously successful, and just through me emailing these people, we did uh, EP with Ryan Green, who did all the fat stuff, and then we did one with Bill, just because I emailed them at the time. Ryan Green maybe like been known at that time for the fat thing, but I don't think Bill. I don't know. Because Bill had just started doing stuff for fat more so towards the end of that one. But I, I knew Bill because I was just like, I live Descendants and stuff. And he's one of my mm -hmm. favorite songwriters. And I thought he could get the picture. God bless him for working with us. Because the shit I sent him <laughs> was so, so fucking atrocious. And he, <laughs> he found like the songs amongst it. And yeah, that was a huge deal. Well, that's kind of the secret of a good producer who can hear what a song can become really because what i mean the demos we sent them were so fucking bad and the, the dudes i had in the band at that time it was just like pick of the day like if it's going to be if we're going to get through it or if we're not you know so props to bill yeah definitely are you still in touch with him today yeah i still i still talk to him and i actually i sent him sent him the record we just finished that we're about to put out and he loved it or you know in so many words so i mean getting that from him it, it, that's such a huge huge deal to me to someone you respect so much as a writer and all around musician for sure your next band uh, lydia vance formed in 2006 yes kind of right in the middle of let's say the MySpace era, was you a big fan of that platform and the opportunities it offered for bands back then? It was a big deal in the UK. Yeah, it was huge. It changed everything. It was the ultimate smoke and mirrors game and it worked, yeah. you know, for a lot of, for a lot of bands if you played it the right way. I think it's one thing that's missed now, especially just for, just for a music point of view where you just, you clicked on someone's profile and a song just played straight away. So yeah, there was no escaping it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One fun thing I read about that band was that you opened up for Rat. Yeah. You said they were being dicks to you, so you announced every song as round and round. We did. Where was that at? It was at the House of Blues here. I was still drinking back then, and um, I had to pee before we went on, and they had encompassed every dressing room backstage, and like, there's only four of them, and I think they one of them had a girlfriend, and like, I just needed to pee, and not one of them <laughs> would let me pee. And, you know, then the round and round thing happened. <laughs> so good. Oh, man. That night, if you, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Mask with Jim Carrey. Dorian Tyrell, the, the bad guy, he's also, he's Zed in uh, Pulp Fiction. He, he was there and we ended up like partying with that dude at the foundation room at the at the the uh, mandalay bay that night and it was just really it was a weird night <laughs> and it all started with the rat show and then we were hanging out with the guy from the mask that's insane yeah. that's a pretty ballsy move to pull as a support act you could have easily just had the plug pulled on you like after the second time again like i <laughs> i was still drinking but yeah i, I don't know what that I, you're just a certain age i guess where you think you can everyone can fucking kiss your ass <laughs> And it's, yeah. How did it go down in front of their crowd? Because I would imagine it was quite an older crowd. The funny thing is, like, they they loved it. Yeah. And no one got <laughs> mad. And the other thing I kept doing was, like, this is our last song. Rat's coming out next. And, like, people would cheer and then would just keep playing. 
Oh shit! <laughs> like I ca- I did that like a mix of that, and then we were done. I think we only had like twenty five thirty minutes or something. Yeah. Super. But yeah, <laughs> I'm a prick. <laughs> <laughs> Again with that band, you had a real buzz. It was surreal, man, because like before we'd never toured or anything like that, and we had this guy locally, and he's since passed. So I'm not, I can't, you know, I'm not going to speak mm-hmm. ill, but just a weird relationship. But he. He knew Elvis Basquette from back in the day when he was living out here. I mean, Elvis came up through the late 90s and it worked on like a million things, uh, like the first lit record, uh, Incubus, and then Chevelle. And then he kind of found like the, the metal, you know, thing. And then, he, I mean, he's famously discovered Ronnie and Escape the Fate and all that, that whole thing. Like that's all, that's Elvis. And the manager guy sent him some stuff and we went out there in the middle of the summer of god 07 08 i don't know and we did three songs and we all hit it off and then like that december we went out and, and did a whole record and by that time we already had atlantic wanting to work with us and then it all fell apart <laughs> yeah did you actually tour with that band i mean you did a few videos and stuff i mean we didn't do anything further than southern california i don't think and it was just a lot of back and forth with that and it was the majority of it was all showcases and stuff like that right like you know it's, it's weird to look back at now because it's like to feel like coveted or, or wanted and to that degree. Like we had a few showcases where once people found out that Atlantic wanted to do the deal, like they started sending out other scouts to like feel out the situation at the shows. And it was like to look back on that now is really surreal. It's almost stuff you don't even think happens anymore. It's like proper sounds like proper old school. Thing. That's the thing, is like you're you as a musician, you're like, oh wow, like my dreams are coming yeah. true. And what was the thing about you? You was hanging out with the, the actor Terrence Howard while he was recording an album. That was also during like those the LA things is one of the labels that was like coming out to see us. They took us to the studio that they like they ran and Terrence Howard was in there finishing his, his first record. And we were just like, we pull up and there's Terrence Howard in a flight suit because he had just done Iron Man or was in the middle of it. And it said Captain Howard on it, on the name tag. And Diana Ross's son was there too. Wow. Which, and they were just like hanging out. And like, he was like the nicest dude. He took us in the studio and he starts playing us like these tracks and he's like acting out like, you know, the instrumentation. And he's just like super hyped. And we just hung out and then like, we're getting ready to leave and we're like saying goodbye. And he's like, no, come here. And I'm like, oh shit, what's he going to do? And he's like, no, come here. And he does this with each one of us too, but like he goes in for a hug and then we hold the hug for like 10 seconds something like that and he's like now we're one or like he like uttered some like and it was <laughs> crazy as shit just bizarre like, this is amazing bizarre. yeah and like you just couldn't write that it's like, it's like the proper surreal thing no it's just like and there he is <laughs> and there's terrence howard the, I'm like, all right that's cool there's you these punk rock kids just rocking up and come and listen to the album <laughs> what do you think of it was he asking you what you thought of it? He has a song on that record called Shine Through It that's fucking amazing song. And I don't think his record really, I mean, it got put out, but I don't think it like did anything really. Not that he needs it to. Right. I didn't even realize he was a, a musical person until I read that you'd met him and I kind of did a bit of searching. I just associated him as being an actor. So. Yeah, but there's this song on it called Shine Through It that's just like a really good song. It's like a mellow ballad. Mm-hmm. Man, I don't know if he wrote it or, if, you know, I don't know what the deal is, but the song is great. Finally, there's a, I read a wonderful quote from you in an article which says that one of your favorite times is back during the first time you're all rehearsing in your mom's living room. You said that feeling was amazing. Everything seemed possible and I felt it was just meant to be. What do you think is so magical about doing something like that? And do you kind of still hold on to that? In that situation, that was the first time like the full Lydia Vance lineup had like come together and Jared the, the bass player from Lydia Vance is, I mean, we've been playing in bands together since, you know, since Lydia Vance, so since 2006. I mean, mm-hmm. we've been best friends since 2003. So he's like, I mean, he's my husband, you know, I have my wife and I, and I have my friendship with Jared, which is, you know, and we're like the antithesis of people too. Like he is, you know, Mr. Outdoors, Mr. Sunshine and, and <laughs> works out every day and etc but like there'd be no band without without jared right but in, in that moment in my mom's living room like i fought so hard to like have a band that was you know for lack of better words unfuckwithable you know mm-hmm. like just knowing 
that you're as good as you possibly can be. And in that moment, my mom's living room after we got everybody on board, like it just that feeling of just like, fuck, this is great. Yeah, I'll never forget that, you know, much like the time, like the first time you ever sit down with like a drummer and a bass player for the first time. It's like that. Mm -hmm. But like on the next level. Yeah. And, And you really do feel like fucking invincible, like we can do whatever we want. And it's it's hard to remember that. And I mean, you lose sight of it so easily with everything that comes with being in a band and trying to be successful with it or make a living off of it, that you lose sight of like what you loved about it to begin with, you know, because I'm always the cups half empty guy. And that, is that why you need someone like Jared in the band? I think so. I think I think that's a huge I think that's a huge part of it. Got to hold on to that excitement from that first time. Yep. So what's the plan with the new album coming out in September, right? Yeah, September 18th, I think is the day. I think we're doing one more single at the end of the month and there'll be some stuff with that. And then I think the record will be, and then there's been talks of, of going to Europe, but I don't know. I mean, that's not going to be any sooner than 2021 at this point. Cause she was over in Europe towards the end of last year, right? But yeah. She didn't do the UK. How was those shows? That was our f- first time over and it was fucking great. Like considering yeah. the realm of possibility of things that could have gone wrong. Like it was just the situation lined up. Well, we flew over and we had, the band we were touring with moving in stereo they're from sweden and they picked us up from the airport we'd never met them so like going into that you never know like it could be <laughs> it could be hell <laughs> that's why you got to be mentally prepared for as a musician a touring musician yeah. anyway yeah it's just like worst possible scenario all the time you got to be ready for it yeah friends for life with those dudes because like, it's always to you know meet similar people <laughs> that have a similar outlook on what you're doing and aren't crazy or level-headed. Because, like, as a band, we're, like, really, <laughs> we're really boring dudes. Right. <laughs> I mean, even when I drank, I still, I mean, I still was not the most, I mean, I, I equated to, like, when Rush was on tour with Kiss and they give them shit for going back to their fucking hotel rooms and reading. But we're, I mean, we like to keep it chill. I don't want any more unnecessary, you know, drama <laughs> than I'm already dealing with. No, definitely not. <laughs> not knowing where I'm going to sleep at night. So yeah, the moving in stereo dudes, great. And that whole tour was fucking great. Aside, we had a couple Italy shows fall through, but everything else I think was as smooth sailing as it could have been. Sweet. Had you been to Europe before? No, that was our first time. And that Blues Cruise Festival set the whole thing up. And I'm eternally grateful for them for doing that because they hit me up on Instagram. I'm like, yeah, sure, we'll go over there. And I didn't expect anything to happen. And it did. You never know with those random messages and yeah. stuff like that. You kind of have to trust your gut. Yeah, because we we didn't even, we just, <laughs> we bought tickets and we were like, well, let's, let's see how this goes. Is there going to be anybody at the airport to pick us up when we get there? <laughs> Crossing your fingers. Yeah, because <laughs> on the way back, we got stuck in Amsterdam for like a day and a half because our connecting flight messed up. And we just thought about after we got home, like how much more terrible it could have been if yeah. that happened coming over because they were meeting us at the airport and they'd driven from Sweden. So right. it could have been so much worse. Yeah. Everything always kind of works out one way or another. <laughs> yeah, you just got to push through it. For sure, man. Well, thank you ever so much for taking the time to do this. It's been lovely to speak to you. No, I'm grateful you want to talk to me, man. <laughs> All right, man. You take care. I'll speak to you soon. Definitely. Thank you so much. Cheers, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I want to say a big thank you to Brendan for taking the time to chat with me on this podcast. Very cool of him. Can't wait to see what the new album Nothing in the Dark is like when it's released next month and hopefully the band will get the chance to tour the UK sometime in the near future. Failing that, I guess it's a good excuse to head to Las Vegas for a holiday and see them live out there. Thanks again to all of you for tuning in and choosing this podcast because I know there's a lot of amazing stuff out there so it means a lot and all the shares, likes and follows are brilliant. Please keep at it. So for now, cheers for listening out there. Take care and see you on the next one.